Well, Yvonne, why don't we start with your grandparents? Um, uh, and uh, maybe first your father's parents, Barney and Pearl Fowler. Where did they live? Um, they lived in, um, on the outskirts of the lost town of Altoona. It, um, according to the census, it was the Altoona Mila, Militia District. Uh -huh. And they lived really close to the Etowah River. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a turn off of what used to be Glade Road and the road leads to George Washington Carver Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the family members lived along that road just, mm -hmm. I mean, easy walking distance from one to the other. Like mm -hmm. an older child would get married and they lived in that area and then another one would get married or a cousin. As a matter of fact, both sides of the family at that time, like from 1930 until they had to move out with the construction of the lake, lived in that area. Uh, none of the houses had electricity. Uh, none of them had indoor plumbing. Um, they were unpainted houses uh, and they were all rented. Mm -hmm. And when the lake was coming... Who did they rent them from? That part I don't know. But I, I know my parents, and of course when you rent, you move a good bit too. Mm -hmm. um, my parents didn't own anything until I uh, started the ninth grade. Oh. So they're tenant farmers? I, I, that so part I don't know. Right, so they were farming. farming. Somebody else's land. Right. Okay. And um, I do remember um, after I was born, some of the rental houses we were in, and of course those were painted, but they still had uh, outdoor bathrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, one was from a Mr. McClure. And that was in the, we lived in the house across from uh, Jonas and Ollie Priest. And I was by there, it, that's out Baker Road, and now the turn is Priest Road. Mm -hmm. But their house is actually still there. And the, the old garage too. Um, the house that we used to live in, which was rented by, from the McClures, was a pretty little house, and it even had a garage too. Of course, we didn't have a car, so, uh, and my dad was a sawmiller, and he always had stuff to put in there. Um, but it was, it was a pretty little house, and um, their son, Alton, had just gotten back from the war, and he had uh, a steel plate in his head, and he had a new car. I remember seeing that. Uh, it was a, the, a new color at the time, salmon. Uh -huh. And, uh, of course, you know, these roads weren't paved at that time. Uh -huh. And it was, it would get dusty even though it, it was a garage without a door. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting in it, oh, he was showing us something. And, of course, as a kid, you start, you mark something. And he got, he got upset with me for marking something in, in the dust on the uh, <laughs> dash of the car. But also, he was the person who taught me how to uh, tie my shoes. Uh -huh. So I'll always remember that. But I, I think we just lived there until I was uh, maybe uh, five or six years old. Uh -huh. And then we moved to another house, and that one was owned by ZT Brand. That, CT was the son of Joe Brand that owned Brand's store up where okay. McDonald's is now. Oh, really? Same side as McDonald's? Same, exactly the same side. And at one time, that was the side of uh, Durham's store uh -huh. after Brand's. Uh -huh. So I guess that's called Cowan at Baker at, mm -hmm. at that location? That's right. And also at that location, uh, where for a few years, my grandparent on the Bennett side had the little mom and pop grocery store. Uh -huh. And when they first bought that, uh, I don't know what was in there before, but it had a jukebox. Uh -huh. And 
we thought that was just the greatest thing in the world. But of course, my grandparents were very religious, and that was the first thing to come out. <laughs> but before it got taken out, uh, we would uh, go in with our friend Ronnie Heaton, and we would dance. Um, maybe that oh, the maybe that increased the <laughs> <laughs> urgency of uh, getting that uh, um, jukebox out of there. Okay. So where was the store in relation to where the Wendy's and the It's McDonald's? exactly where Wendy's is now. Oh, really? Right. How about that? It, it was on that side. The brand store was across 92. Uh -huh. And Pleasant Hill Baptist Church was where Walgreens is. Okay. Now, Pleasant, is, is Pleasant Hill Baptist Church still in existence? Mm, I don't think so. I, I couldn't find it. I was just oh. Wondering. But, I mean, it was there for years. Okay. So it's where the Walgreens is. Mm-hmm. And? Do you think that when you walk drive by there, do you remember what used to be there? I do. Mm -hmm. And... It was deemed a good spot because on the weekend, that's one of the ways people got to that part of the lake. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason they had live bait, which was not one of my favorite things mm -hmm. to do. To, mm -hmm. <laughs> if somebody came in wanting um, minnows or crickets. Yeah. Um, they also had gas and I pumped gas. I preferred pumping a certain dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I didn't like having to wait for it to get full because I was afraid it would spew out. But I did it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we had a mimeograph machine and I, ran, I wrote out the specials for the week and ran those off. And they, my granddad somehow disseminated them. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, ran the cash register uh, on Thursdays, my grandmother and I would total up all the um, credit, people who had bought things on credit. Uh -huh. And there was a whole box, uh -huh. and it, these little um, tablets, and we had written their last name at the top of it, and that was all in there. So if, uh, if Mr. Ragsdale came in, you know, it would appear in the R's, and it'd say Ragsdale, and you'd They'd get what they wanted and say, so you know, guess, put it on my account, I and we did. Well, folk really had to rely on credit because they didn't really make any money until the crops came in. Right. You're right. So, and there weren't many jobs. Mm -hmm. So, and like I said, and they didn't have transportation. Mm -hmm. My sister told me when uh, she remembered, she's six years older than I am, and she remembered the day that I was born. Now, I was born at home. I was not born in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And she and her two cousins had ridden in the wagon with my grandfather Fowler, daddy's father, to take corn to the corn mill. Mm -hmm. And when they got back, she had a baby sister. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Kitty that you're talking about. That's right, yeah. But Kitty uh, got married real early. Oh, unbelievable. Um, it, it, she got married at 15. She was gonna be, it was like two weeks before her birthday. Mm -hmm. But I can't believe, a Justice of the Peace and Emerson actually married them knowing she wasn't 16 yet. But. Uh, she married Henry Jordan of Emerson, and uh, they had uh, three children, a girl and two boys. Mm -hmm. So when she left the house, I was only nine years old, mm -hmm. and Judy was seven. So I'm really a middle child, but I've always felt like the older child, and I've always felt responsible for my younger sister. Mm -hmm. It, and she's told me recently, well, I'm sorry you felt responsible for me. <laughs> I, said, I just did. I, I told her, I said, I felt like it was you and me against the world. <laughs> so that's Judy. 
Right. And uh, did she work in the store also? Uh, not much. Okay. She, uh, again, she was two years younger she was and, child. right. <laughs> and a lot of this time, it, it would be, you know, the busier times. Now, if we were there after school one day, um, that would, we'd just be getting a snack or something. Uh -huh. But um, no, when I was helping, it was, like I said, it was either Thursday when we were adding up the bills and putting mm -hmm. on tax and stuff, um, or helping out Friday and Saturday, because those are the busy days when people are coming in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you got a good education working in the store. Your math, your math skills must have been superb. After they, they are, <laughs> and I love math. <laughs> <laughs> that that was has always been my favorite subject, and I, I mean, you can go a long way with math. <laughs> my brother and I would play a board baseball game all summer long and we'd be calculating batting averages for oh. we'd have different points so you know if somebody had made us do all that math in the summertime we would have thought it was tyranny I guess but exactly we, but learned, we learned our math skills just mm -hmm. from having fun right it sounds like in your case from, from work right <laughs> but um, I, I want to tell you something about my uh, um, grand well let me start yes. My um, DNA analysis has shown that uh, my ancestors came mainly from England and Western Europe. Uh -huh. And in the 1700s, they migrated to um, Western North Carolina. And then in the 1800s, they migrated further into the mountains of North Georgia. And they settled in Rabin County, Gilmore County, and Fannin County. Okay. And it was from those parts of the states that uh, at least by 19, late 20s, early 30s, both sides actually ended up in Altoona, okay. in, uh, which was uh, uh, rural Bartow County. Mm -hmm. And the, my father's parents, Barney Fowler at 25, and Pearlie Snow Newberry, I love her name, uh, was 15. So Pearly Snow, Snow Newberry. Newberry. They married in 1904. He was 10 years her senior. They had eight children, six girls and two boys. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad was the older of the two boys, and he was the uh, third child among the eight. Mm -hmm. My grandparents on my mother's side, uh, Tom Bennett, was uh, 22 mm -hmm. when he married my grandmother, Annie Payne, and she was 16, and that was in 1920. Okay. Now there's a pain community. Is that from the pain side of the family, or probably? Okay. But you're right. There is a pain community over in that same area. Uh -huh. um, they got married in 1920, and they had ten children. Mm. And my mother, uh, five of each, five girls and five boys. And the uh, my mother was the oldest girl. She had one older brother. Mm -hmm. And then my parents, Leonard Fowler, uh, he was 27 when he married Lorene Bennett, and she was 17. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1939. Okay. And then uh, my sister Kitty was born in 1940. Mm -hmm. And then six years later, I was born, and then two years later, Judy was born. Okay. And, and it turned out that the two Fowler boys, well, my dad never had any male children, and his brother Wayne never had any children. Mm -hmm. So at least that part of the Fowlers. Uh, mm -hmm. But 
Of course, there are others. Mm -hmm. um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about your mother. Um, and um, uh, you, you learned to sew from her. I think. Could you tell, uh, tell about that? Right. Uh, she was quite the seamstress. Um, she made all our clothes, mm -hmm. and we were always very clean and very well dressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but as kids will be, we always wanted store bought clothes, which were nowhere near as cute uh, as what she was making us. And she since Judy and I were close to the same size, uh, she always dressed us alike, and people invariably ask if we were trans. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, after Kitty uh, left home, um, it was just the two of us, <clears throat> and we were playmates, mm -hmm. best friends in high school, and still best friends. Mm -hmm. Even when I uh, left Georgia to go to, um, to, to work in Nashville and then in Memphis, mm -hmm. uh, we continued to keep in close touch. Mm -hmm. So she was really pleased when we moved back to Acworth. I bet. Now tell me, uh, your mother <clears throat> got a job somewhere along the line. Right. Uh, my mother was an amazing woman. She could butcher a hog. Uh, she could paint a house inside and outside. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, she could sew. Uh, as far back as I can remember, we had a sewing machine in the house. Of course, it started out as a pedal machine. Mm -hmm. um, she, we didn't have much. And sometimes, I mean, she rarely had money for extras, and sometimes she didn't even have the money for essentials. Mm -hmm. But if anybody could ever make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, my mother could. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I learned from her was, um, see what you have and make do of it. See what you can make with it. And, and I still have fun doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just. <laughs> now, she, went, she worked at O&B Manufacturing? Yeah, yes, and I forgot to tell you that. And at that time, most women were not working. They were staying home, keeping the children. And the, at least in my family, most of them were working on a farm, mm -hmm. unless they were like my dad, who could operate a, a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. And he um, was part of the clearing uh, of the trees from the land where the lake was going mm -hmm. to be. And then later he worked at uh, sawmills. But I guess she decided that she needed to make some money. And she learned how to drive so she could go to work. Mm -hmm. So. Here, we, we were living on Highway 92 um, in the house that we were renting from ZT Brand. Mm -hmm. And she learned how to drive and started working at OMB. And she worked there for several years. And then from there, just then at one point, she um, began working at Unique. So, you know, she had a, an employment, good employment history. Okay. And so she was able to, and um, several people that were at Unique, even Rick Keenel, who was a kid at the time, I think he might have been uh, working there in the summer while he was in high school, mm -hmm. but he remembers my mother working there. Mm -hmm. And several of her family members, her sister worked there and a couple of her nephews mm -hmm. worked there. What was she doing at Unique? Uh, I, it was something to do with socks, but I don't know exactly what. But I, I know at OMB, because one time she took me there mm -hmm. to see where she was working. Of course, it was, I mean, it was kind of scary looking, you know, all these 
fancy sewing machines. Mm -hmm. It looked like big, it didn't look like sewing machines, it was big equipment. And everything was happening so fast. Mm -hmm. It's very different from sitting down at your pedal machine mm -hmm. and, and making a garment. But mm -hmm. that's, that's where she worked. Okay. Now, um, it sounds like you had a little bit of fun along the way because after Albertuna came in and Lake Atwork, you were going to the beach and there's a, there's a smoking story in, in there. That's right, there is. Um, Judy and I were teenagers, and like I said, we did a lot of things together. Um, according to her memory, she said, since I was older and I had a driver's license, that my parents made me take her with me. But I don't remember it that way. I just remember us both being mm -hmm. friends and doing a lot of things together. Mm -hmm. So we went to the beach as teenagers. We had a beach blanket and we were lying out sunning. And I have no idea how I got the cigarette. I, I had somehow gotten one. and. In order to look more mature and sophisticated, um, I decided to light up the cigarette. And I didn't light the cigarette, I lit the blanket. I, I, didn't, the, I didn't burn up the whole blanket, just a part of it. Didn't light anything on the cigarette. I don't know how I missed that. But I decided I just wasn't coordinated enough to smoke. And I've never smoked. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else in your family smoke? Uh, only my dad. And he smoked a lot. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, he uh, died of, well, he died of a heart attack, but he had emphysema for several years. Wow. Now there's a story about when the lake comes in, it floods your land and you have to move. That's right. Now this was, um, that was before I was born. But yeah, you know, so that was my family, my oh. both sets of grandparents. But I thought they built the lake in 49 and 50. Well, but they had to clear the land. Oh, I see. And that's when they had to move. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And like I said, the um, my grandparents on the Fowler side lived closest to the Etowah River. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, the pasture behind the house, uh -huh. the river actually came up to the pasture. So... Um, what I've been told is the, you know, the closer you live to the river, the sooner they started getting you out. And then, mm -hmm. but along that same strip of road were all these other relatives mm -hmm. that also were going to have to move. Mm -hmm. But my grandparents that lived down there, you know, where they could actually see the river, mm -hmm. uh, they were out first. And where they ended up moving was to... Cherokee County. Mm -hmm. So they oh. moved from Bartow to Cherokee, but it's really just outside of Backward. Exactly, and it's not very far. It's just uh, down Glade Road a little, and then New Hope Church Road. Okay. And if you're familiar with um, that road in Cherokee County, there's an old store, and one of my uncles owned and operated that for a while. That was Reuben Bennett. Okay. So, so just a country store? So and that, now it was, I guess they had some groceries, but it, to, when I was in there, it had more hardware kind of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like barrels of nails, mm -hmm. things like that. But our, when I went to Oak Grove School, the school bus stopped there and would let the kids get off and buy an ice cream or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, I think I was always afraid to get off because I was afraid I wouldn't get back on the bus in time. <laughs> 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 but the uh, uh, but when the 
my grandparents, the Fowlers, moved from near the lake. They moved a little farther down uh, on the road toward Galt Ferry. But again, it wasn't all that far, but it was, it was down on that side um, of the highway. And at that time, that, and I remember that house very well because I've been there a lot of times. It's, mm -hmm. it's not still standing. It was unpainted. It was a big house. It had a big barn. It had a uh, place where you could park a car. So I guess you could call it a garage. And my granddad had um, pigs and chickens and things, uh, you know, there in the outer yard. But they always had a lot of people in the family because my dad's older sister never married. One of his sisters uh, divorced early in her marriage, and she had two children. So she and the two children lived there. And then there were two other younger sisters mm -hmm. who were like teenagers at that time. Mm -hmm. So there was always a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how does... Um What's that? Is it 1974 when uh, I-75 disrupts the family again? That's right. Can, can you believe that twice in a lifetime? <laughs> um, they were uh, living, the, this was the only house my parents had ever owned. Mm -hmm. It was a Jim Walter home that uh, had gone into foreclosure. And it so it wasn't, as finished as usually the Jim Walter homes were c completely finished on the outside and then the people who bought it would do the inside. Mm -hmm. But um, so they bought that and fortunately my brother-in-law, Henry Jordan, uh, was in construction and he basically finished the house out and so that's where they moved. That would have been in 1960, mm -hmm. and 1960. they 1960. That's when they moved into that house. Okay. Okay. So that's what they're going to move from. Mm -hmm. okay. That's when they're moved okay. from. Okay. But as far as they were concerned, I mean, by the time they were, when they were building the highway or interstate, mm -hmm. and it was looking like you're going to have to go. Well, the Jim, Jim Walter home, and they, uh, they finish it and move into it in the 60s. Mm-hmm. 1960. 1960. And of course, um, when it becomes pretty clear that something's going to happen with the uh, interchange for Interstate 75, at that point, they're in their 50s and 60s. They didn't want to move, mm -hmm. but they didn't have any choice. And of course, the state didn't take all the property. They just took what they needed, mm -hmm. oh, so leaving, they leaving them a little strip, leaving my parents a little strip with no access. So see, they were taking the front. Mm -hmm. but, a little strip with no access. Right, what oh, little was left. <laughs> they just wouldn't do that. <laughs> so that's when um, my parents found a house, and by this time it's, it is in Ackworth and it was on Terrace Drive, mm -hmm. which is just with less than a mile from here. Mm -hmm. And so that's where uh, they lived the rest of their lives. Uh, I helped them move into uh, this house on Terrace Drive, Thanksgiving of 1974. Okay. And uh, they were there ever since. My dad died in 1980, and my mom died in 2005. And my sister, Judy, lives in that house now. Oh, how about that? Mm -hmm. How old is the house? Actually, it was new. Oh. Uh, I, they had just started that subdivision 
um, at the time, and I think that might have been one of the mm -hmm. last ones um, mm -hmm. to be purchased. Of course, in the long run, it was good for them because it it was newer, the insulation was better, um, it had air conditioning, and the other house, they had air conditioning, but it was with window units. Okay, so you go to uh, Oak Grove Elementary. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, you obviously were a superior student. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> you know, I, family, I love to learn. Did your family emphasize education? No. <laughs> no, I, I just got into time. it and... Uh -huh. I really enjoyed learning all these things, mm -hmm. and um, was, when I was at Oak Grove, um, did a lot of extracurricular things like participating in plays, mm -hmm. um, and we would. Um, I'm pretty good at drawing, so uh, often we would. They would take us to Canton to the business section, and like if it was Halloween, then we drew scenes on the windows of the merchants. Mm -hmm. And you could see it through the glass, of course, front and back. Mm -hmm. I think we usually drew it on the inside in case it rained. But so I had the opportunity to do um, a lot of things like that. And of course, uh, we would make Valentines at for Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. but uh, I, yeah, I really like that. And my favorite teacher of all time was at Oak Grove, mm -hmm. and that was uh, Miss Martha Chapman. Okay. She was married to Clarence Chapman. He was the principal of Oak Grove, and he taught me in the eighth grade. But Miss Chapman was very uh, encouraging um, about my work, and uh, wanted me to continue my education after high school. Of course, this was just in the seventh grade. Um, and she encouraged me to go to North Cobb High School instead of Cherokee High. Mm -hmm. Again, we were living in the little Jim Walter home, which technically is in Cherokee County. Mm -hmm but an easy walk to the county line. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you could do that. Um, Cherokee was a much small, I mean, it was a much larger school than North Cobb was. And at the time, it was the only one in, in all of Cherokee County, and it was in Canton. Mm -hmm. And to get there on the school bus took at least an hour each way. So North Carolina High was a lot closer. It was closer and it was uh, newer. Uh -huh. I think it had just opened a year or two before I started there. Uh -huh. So um, that's that's what I did. And it, it wasn't all that inconvenient, again, because we were so close. And my grandmother at that time, they had the store, uh -huh. which was in Cobb County, and their house was about two houses down from Pleasant Hill. So the store, the store where the Wendy's is now was in Cobb County, mm -hmm. but Oak Grove Elementary was in Cherokee. Right. And like you say, and it's it, a short the Oak, Right, and Oak Grove Elementary is um, like between here and Woodstock, because a lot of the kids that went there uh, were Mm -hmm. from the Woodstock area. Mm -hmm. But again, going all the way to Canton, Georgia for high school, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, what a long day. Mm -hmm. Plus, with so many students, you're not going to get the attention mm -hmm. uh, as uh, you would so at the smaller no school. So there was problem living in one county and going to school in the other? No, not at that time, there wasn't. Okay. But by the time... Uh, my sister Judy started two years later. Mm -hmm. um, 
they wouldn't let her go there. And it, at that point, they started charging a tuition. I guess if they had space, they would. Um, so she went to um, Cherokee High, I think, for a week or two and, and came home crying every day. Um, and somehow my mother scrambled together enough money to so she could go to North Cobb. Mm -hmm. But they were letting me stay there because I had already started. Okay. So I was, I, I was lucky in that respect. But, you know, talking about encouragement, um, my mother did not want me to go to college. Oh, really? Right. She said, and I said, well, why? She said, when you get married, I'll lose you then. And I don't want to lose you before then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, so going to college, you, well, you moved to Athens. So, well, and so, you know, here I am going against my parents. Uh -huh. But I, I, I felt really strongly about it. Yeah. But you did work for a year before you went to college? Right. And um, I, I think one of the reasons was I wouldn't even ask them for money to take the college entrance exam. Because mm -hmm. I knew they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want you to go. And then when I started working, um, I funded it myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, I, and actually I started night school oh. at the University of Georgia Extension in Marietta, okay. where, um, where, what was the name of it? I guess where Southern Poly is going to be. Yes, there. right, it was. I took... Tennessee College, Marietta campus. Right, the university. right. Yeah. I, so I was, at the time I was working at either all state insurance or at the Department of Labor. Anyway, both of those were in the Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. I'm living in Ackworth, so I'm commuting, mm -hmm. and I'm taking two courses at night there. And you're commuting before there's an interstate to get you there. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly right. So it was, it was very hard. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I guess I got down to my lightest weight. I was <laughs> doing so much. But, for, so for three quarters, I took two courses a quarter and uh, applied uh, for a scholarship, won a scholarship, the mm -hmm. Board of Regents Scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that was a godsend. And I had that my whole college career. Okay. So when did uh, you get through college in the late 60s, 1970, somewhere in there? Mm -hmm. okay. and you were, I graduated in 1969. And you were valedictorian? I was, and I gave the valedictory address. How about that? Uh, since then, someone had told me that they keep all those, you know, at, at the in archives or all on file at the uh -huh. library. Uh -huh. And one time when I was there, I did, it was there. And of course, you know, you look back on something that you wrote years ago and you think, oh, what was I thinking? But it was oh, what, what more, it was, it involved some political stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> but I was surprised when I was contacted um, by, um, it, on one of the one of the deans on old campus uh -huh. um, but he uh they said that you know oh uh, you're going to be the valedictorian and you know you work with so and so um of course at the time they had to review what i was going to say so but well, it must not have been too political well i mean i had to make some, no i had to make some revisions <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, I, I had made some comments about the then governor. Um, oh. 
You talk about less dramatic? Yes, oh, okay. I did. I did. And well, that's interesting. Uh, uh, I, I gather they weren't too flattering. <laughs> I think I was saying something to the effect of, you know, it was an embarrassment, you know, to no, have him forgotten. representing us. Well, he was a staunch segregationist. He, he definitely was. <laughs> but, um... Teachers actually got an increase in salary, though, while he was governor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you would remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they, they made you take that out? Uh... Toned it down. Toned it down. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you were still critical of Western. <laughs> just not as... Not as sharp. Okay. Yeah, not as sharp, I guess, as okay. before. And that you had a degree in business administration? Right. And the reason I wanted to go into business was I was tired of being poor. Mm -hmm. I wanted something where I could make some money, and I thought that was the... Uh, the best bet for me. You didn't want to teach school. Well, let me tell you this. When I was talking about wanting to go to college, and like I told you, my mother did, just didn't want me to go to college, period. And around some of my other relatives, like when I was at my uh, grandparents' house, and there were always a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. And um, I said I wanted to go to college. And they asked me, what are you going to be, a teacher or a nurse? Mm -hmm. Like, those are the only occupations available to women. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those. But I just didn't like the idea of being forced into something. And at the time, neither one of them were money makers. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> and I took typing my very last year in high school. And thank goodness I did, because it saved my life. <laughs> it's a good skill to have. It is. And, you know, I didn't have to pay people to type my stuff in college. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. I, could, I could do my own stuff. Mm -hmm. Before we get away from your childhood, uh, who's Sue Plumley? When we lived in the house that we rented from ZT Brand, the Plumleys lived across the street from us. Mm -hmm. And by the way, and that was Highway 92, it was not paved, and you can imagine how dusty it would get mm -hmm. in the summer. And they had trucks that dripped oil that was to cut down the dust. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they... Uh, one of the fondest memories I have is Judy and I playing Barbie dolls with Sue. Mm -hmm. We all had Barbie dolls, and of course we always made clothes. And my mom, since she was working at this uh, children's clothing manufacturing place, mm -hmm. she would bring home these scraps, leftover scraps. Mm -hmm. And of course for a Barbie doll, you don't, you don't need much material because mm -hmm. they're so small. Mm -hmm. So our dolls had we would have like fur wraps, because mm -hmm. one of the things they made little car coats for kids, and often they'd have the f hood with a fur lining. Mm -hmm. So we had all kinds of unusual material, and we had some of the best dressed Barbies around. Mm -hmm. And then um, her brother Donnie, Donnie was between Judy's age and mine. Sue was younger than mm -hmm. all of us, uh, so he became the fourth person in the play group. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was we pretended we were making movies. Mm -hmm. Now, this did not, did not involve any cameras. <laughs> this only involved imagination. And um, we, of course, used bicycles for the vehicles. Uh, we used any, any kind of prop that we could 
well, pretend was a problem. Mm -hmm. They had an orchard, so there was the orchard we could film there. Mm -hmm. They had a big barn in the backyard. We could film there and in their yard or anything. And they also had a smokehouse at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we made movies and since I was the oldest, I was usually the director of the movie or the boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when they went on vacation, we, we, we loved them. We were there, you know, playing together for years. Uh, when they went on, we could not afford to go on vacation, <laughs> but they went on vacation. When they went on vacation, at the, the time when they had, still had a cow, Mm -hmm. My mother would go over and milk the cow mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And I could ride her older sister's bicycle. I never had a bicycle. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I knew how to ride one. But yeah, we had many, many fun uh, memories with Did them. Did you write your scripts for the movies? Or? Oh, no. No, we made them up as we went along. <laughs> Sounds like a pleasant childhood. Uh, yes, it was. It was. What, what, what did you think about act work at that time? Uh, I didn't see much of it. Um, we just went to uh, town a uh, few times a year. Mm -hmm. you know, we, sometimes to buy clothes, definitely before school started, mm -hmm. you know, to get school supplies. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as we got older, um, my mom would take us to Marietta for our school supplies, mm -hmm. and McClellan's was my favorite. And I, I loved the smell of popcorn when you walked in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, that was a big deal to go there. Okay. Well, you must have studied a lot of economics when you were in college because you've become an economist. Right, and right, I, I majored in economics and I had a um, minor in finance. The, um, my first job once I had a degree was at, um, in Athens at USDA's Agricultural Research Center. Mm -hmm. And it had just opened a couple of years before that. Um, so that's the Russell Research Center and you call it the Agricultural Research, yeah, mm -hmm. and but it okay. is uh, federal. It's USDA, yeah. U.S. Department of Agriculture. So, uh, where, where is that located? Um, out from where the um, marriage student housing okay. was. Yeah. I I can't remember the so the were, name of that street. So you were there for about seven years. I was mm -hmm. right. And, uh, so and the reason I, see, I graduated from college, uh -huh. and job-wise, I would have fared better to come back to the Atlanta area. Uh -huh. But I had gotten married, and my husband had graduated a year before I had. Uh -huh. And he had gotten uh, into the management training program at what was then CNS Bank. Uh -huh. And so he was... He had been in that for a year. Okay. And so we were trying to stay in Athens mm -hmm. because of that, and we felt like I could do something. Yeah. Um, well, so so I, I did a really gutsy thing. Well, I, everything I tried to get, it was a clerical position. Mm -hmm. And uh, Coca-Cola had an office there. It wasn't their headquarters, but... Uh, all they offered me was a, a clerical position. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I'm just feeling really high. Like, hey, I was valedictorian yeah. and da da da. Sure. So, I went to my college dean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I'm saying, you know, I'm your valedictorian and I have been looking for jobs and I can't get anything but a clerical one here. And so he starts looking through some things, and he says, well, well, what about this? And he's the one that sent me there. Mm -hmm. And um, they 
created a temporary position. And that's what I started as. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and I did well, and they turned it into a permanent one. So it sounds like you had some pull. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That they created so, a job. Some, Were there any other women working as economists there? Um, no. As a matter of fact, there were just two economists, and I was working for um, the man who was there. Because mm -hmm. okay. most of the people that worked there were um, hard scientists, you know, mm -hmm. chemists and. Yeah. What, what did you do as an economist for them? Mostly what we did was to do cost-benefit analysis, mm -hmm. that type of thing, for what they were researching, what the scientists were researching. Or mm -hmm. researching. I see. Okay. So you did that for seven years, and then briefly you're at the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. Right. And, but then you moved to HUD, and that's going to be your lifelong career then. Right. It, it, that was, it surprised me. I mean, I didn't, obviously there are not that many agencies that have economists. Mm -hmm. But, um, so after, after I, um, Left to Athens. Well, the timing for leaving the job in Athens was um, I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. My my son had had been born uh, in 1972. We were mm -hmm. still in Athens, mm -hmm. and then um, she was going to be born in April of '76. So that's when I left, and then I I was home for. Um, about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then in order to get back in the workforce, um, I could only get the uh, analyst position at the Federal Reserve Bank, which was downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And it, at that, I didn't make as much money as I had before in this position. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't as high a level position as I had been in before. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the reason I was looking to uh, find an opening in the federal government. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I interviewed in the, um, there's a it's kind of park-like setting outside the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, the guy from HUD came to interview me. I couldn't get any time off from work. So we, we just did the interview outside uh, yeah. the building. Okay. And one of the things that I liked so much about, well, for the first few years, it, it was doing similar work to what I had done for uh -huh. USDA. But of course, with this, I mean, you're talking about housing studies and mm -hmm. um, population, m movement of people, that kind of thing. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, we had, this was, at, at that point, um, I was working for the, uh, I started out working for the original economist, and mm -hmm. then I, uh, at some point, I began working for the uh, um, economist over Georgia. Mm -hmm. And so we had did housing market studies like in I uh, and at that that point there were um, our boss was an economist and then there were three of us mm -hmm. a, a woman a man and me yeah. and uh, we did market studies like for um, Savannah Augusta mm -hmm. Columbus mm -hmm. and um, sometimes since it was a regional office. Um, I'd be sent to another, someplace outside of Georgia uh, to do a study. Mm -hmm. Like, um, uh, Sanibel, uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, uh -huh. just different, th but, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. And, but then I figured 
if you're going to work at HUD, you really need a housing position. Mm -hmm. And that's when I broke into management. And uh, the first management job I had was as a branch chief in um, information systems. Mm -hmm. And I had I was in charge of the computer room and uh, the. Well, I was going to say information system sounds very mathematical. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, and then and and, and also it was the time when we were um, getting more and more computers in, mm -hmm. and so I people that were in charge mm -hmm. of getting those out, training people. We had a lot of training classes. Mm -hmm. um, all those people worked for me. Yeah. But we had a lot of fun, and some of the pictures I brought show uh, some of the great things that we did mm -hmm. uh, as, as a group when I was a uh, mm -hmm. branch chief. Mm -hmm. And I, later I was a branch chief in single family housing, mm -hmm. and also after that I was a branch chief in multifamily housing. And in, in single family housing, uh, basically we were managing and selling foreclosed properties. And I, I think probably our biggest year uh, at the time was about three, we sold about 3,000 HUD homes. I mean, everybody's heard of HUD homes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, since then it's contracted out. But at the time, mm -hmm. we were doing that you know, so I had employees who were realty specialists, and they'd have uh, areas assigned to them. They had to go out and check on the houses, and uh, we had uh, contracts with uh, property management firms to go clean them up, mm -hmm. uh, do whatever had to be done. Uh, but what I found at HUD was that they were it was very similar to private industry mm -hmm. because you could make so many decisions and, and you, you weren't just stymied and having to suggest something to someone else and maybe sooner or later they'll do it or, or maybe it'll just dry on the vine. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had some um, auctions and that was really fun. These would be at big hotels mm -hmm. in Atlanta and uh, uh, my boss and I would be at the table and we'd be making decisions, immediate decisions about what's being bid. And you know how fast auctions go. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it, it was really, and my employees loved it too, mm -hmm. but it, it was really a lot of fun. Oh, so we, we had all kinds of things like that. And then on the, for multifamily housing, um, of course, that's a lot bigger scale. And for that, um, my jurisdiction was all the way to the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And some of the worst ones that we got were New York, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and, and guess when the people would, the, man, man, the management on site would leave. It would be like Friday afternoon late. Uh -huh. So there we're stuck late Friday night and probably and working Saturday uh -huh. trying to get people in place to protect the property. Mm -hmm. So, wow. but it, wow. it, it, was, it was really interesting. And then I went to um, Nashville mm -hmm. for three years. Mm -hmm. Love loved that town. Mm -hmm. It was a great place. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a senior community builder there. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they were focusing on outreach to nonprofits, the mm -hmm. community. Uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, educational type work, worked with Home Depot, mm -hmm. you know, to put on these sessions and, and to help people become homeowners. Mm -hmm. And after success there, Fortunately, an opening came up in Memphis for the um, office director. And this and before, up to 2001 at this point. Exactly, and I was fortunate enough to be selected for that. And that was probably my favorite job mm -hmm. um, because uh, 
I got to do so many different things. Uh, m met a lot of uh, bigwigs from Washington. I, I have some pictures to, to show you of the various uh, secretaries of HUD that mm -hmm. I've met over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, I mean, everything wasn't easy. Uh, in that position, I represented the secretary mm -hmm. uh, at, at the Memphis level. So, like, congressmen and senators, um, and sometimes they didn't really understand how things work. But, I mean, they were wanting me to make sure that HUD did so-and-so. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they didn't remember that. Maybe they were one political party, and at that time, HUD leadership was another. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I, it's just kind of it, yes, it, it, it put me in the middle. <laughs> How many uh, people would work for you at, at the, in Memphis? How many people were in the office um, that you directed? I, probably when I got there, it was probably, a, well, I, it was over a hundred. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were, I had some direct reports and, you know, some, I was the second mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. um, because it got to the point where um, we did have telework, but there were, were a number of them where their, the boss in their program or technical area um, might be in Louisville mm -hmm. or Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. but they still had some response Ability to me. Right. Now, for a lot of your career, you were federal women's program manager. Oh, yes. Talk about that and maybe just talk a little bit about uh, what women had to overcome in those oh, yes. several decades. Right. One of the um, things that I'll start with is uh, when my mother was in the seventh grade, her parents made her quit school. And, and she told me she cried when they made her do that. Um, but this, this wasn't uncommon in, among rural, rural families in the South. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it right. And for the longest time, I, kind of blame my grandmother. He's like, you know, why mm -hmm. couldn't you take care of all those kids that you had? Mm -hmm. But anyway, so she, that's what she had. She had to stop school in the seventh grade. And uh, she was the oldest girl. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here they had all these other, eight other kids. Mm -hmm. So she had to uh, work at home and take care of the younger siblings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time, women couldn't, well, they had gotten the vote in 1920, but it sure takes a long time for that to filter down into reality. Mm -hmm. um, but um, women couldn't serve on a jury. They couldn't borrow money without uh, a man um, co-signing with them. Mm -hmm. And so when I had the opportunity <laughs> It, this was just a collateral duty, so, mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, I served as Federal Women's Program Manager um, both at the Russell Research Center and um, when I got to HUD. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did, well, I, I wrote a newsletter. Um, I put on programs educating mm -hmm. women, you know, what could be, what they could do. Mm -hmm. um, 
that they weren't maybe feeling like was open to them right. at the time. Right. Um, I analyzed data, mm -hmm. and, and of course this was mostly for management to show um, the inequities because mm -hmm. women were not in the higher paying jobs. They were uh, isolated in clerical positions. Mm -hmm. They weren't in the supervisory jobs. Um, and, you know, at, at some point earlier on, if somebody, if a woman got pregnant, you know, then they would probably get fired from their job. Mm. And even if that weren't the case, that was an excuse that was used to keep from putting women in a uh, responsible position. Mm -hmm. Oh, she'll, she'll get married and uh, get pregnant and, you know, mm -hmm. our investment will be down the drain. Mm -hmm. Did you feel any personal discrimination in terms of pay and what have you while you were going through your career? I did, and if I hadn't been willing to move and relocate out of Atlanta, uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to retire at the grade that I did. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the case with the men that I knew. Mm -hmm. All they had to do was stay there. Mm -hmm. And it's like someone was looking out for them. Have we made any progress in the last 40 years or so? <laughs> Gee, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so you retire about 2008. Right. And uh, you come back and uh, you have some family responsibilities to take care of elderly parents or family members. Yes, that, that was the main reason that we moved from Memphis to uh, back to Ackworth. Uh, I had a lot of the members of my family were uh, getting older, and I have been able to do what I had intended by helping with them. Uh -huh. I've uh, helped with uh, my sister who, who just died in January, um, my Kitty, Kitty. Uh -huh. and I helped with um, my aunt. Uh, she died last year. But she was 94, though. She uh -huh. had a, a long life. Uh, I help with my niece, who um, died at 58 from cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, my brother-in-law, Henry uh, uh, Jordan mm -hmm. from Emerson. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I'm, I'm glad that I was here to uh, offer a hand in yeah. that. Now, is it after you retired that you're doing the voting? Uh, yes, work? right. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what exactly was it, does a voting monitor do? Or I guess even before that, you're a voting official in Tennessee? Mm -hmm. Talk the, about what you were doing. Uh, in Tennessee, uh, I worked at... Um, voting sites and of course you have to take some training for that and you get paid minimal mm -hmm. wages but um, I just wanted to do it as a matter of fact my husband did it with me mm -hmm. and um, probably the most interesting time was when Obama was running for uh, president first the first time, time first time mm -hmm. and that we actually had uh, an african-american woman come in she was a hundred and six years old she had never voted wow. but uh, she came in uh, to vote for uh, mr. Obama uh -huh. I mean the news people came and you know, they had the story on the news and all uh -huh. but um, because of that, there were a lot of people uh, registering. So we we did mm -hmm. that work before the actual election, uh, you know, getting people registered. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it, that one turned into a, an, an extra long time because we were uh, doing the registration uh -huh. and uh, then doing the election as well. The, who are you actually working for? Is this part of the federal job to do this? No, it was the um, uh, Shelby County oh, uh, Memphis. Voting Commission. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. Okay. And then the. So you're basically trying to make sure that uh, nobody is uh, denied the right to vote on the basis of race. Is that basically it? Mm -hmm. No discrimination. Right. Well, when we were, when I was working for uh, Shelby County, it was getting people registered to vote, mm -hmm. and then checking them when, on election day when they came in to be sure that they were registered. Mm -hmm. And if you know if they had someone, if they needed assistance mm -hmm. with someone. Uh, that that yeah. get approved. Uh -huh. um, at the time, it was only when I was working in for uh, voting rights mm -hmm. that um, that's when we were doing interviewing of people who had been to the polls after they had voted and asking mm -hmm. them some questions. Because mm -hmm. there, you, um, with the Voting Rights Act, You want to be sure everybody has access to the voting place. They're not turned away, mm -hmm. not discouraged. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a team that's put together, and it's run by the Justice Department, U.S. Justice Department. And so this is when you're going into Alabama and South Dakota and right. Mississippi? Right, right. Uh, and a, a friend of mine at the Memphis HUD office uh, had been doing this, and she suggested that I might want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I um, filled out an application and sent it in, and I mean, it, it was two or three years before I ever heard anything. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I filled out the application before I retired, but it was uh, after, once I retired, then mm -hmm. I got the first call about going, uh -huh. and that was to um, Clarkdale, Mississippi, mm -hmm. where there had been a, a history of uh, African Americans being discouraged mm -hmm. or turned away from polls mm -hmm. for flimsy mm -hmm. uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. And typically, we well, let me back up. I and of course these would be places where there might have been problems in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was living in Memphis, I went to um, Clarkdale in Mississippi. Uh, when I had moved back uh, here to Ackworth, I have been to Montgomery, Alabama mm -hmm. on two different occasions mm -hmm. as part of the uh, mm -hmm. voting rights team. And then uh, the other one that I've done was um, flew out to Sioux Falls, South Dakota mm -hmm. and did one there. And of course the, the minority of concern there were Native Americans. Sure. But we were a team Typically, it would involve about four or five days, very intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, first day would be, um, would all sit together. We had a, um, an instructor who would go over all the rules again and any kind of uh, special things we needed to know about that particular location. Mm -hmm. And then we would be there for the election day. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be, um, talking to people um, as they left the, the voting place. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. Some of them would talk to us and some wouldn't, but we, we wrote it up and there okay, were... So you're not actually intervening, you're taking records? 
Exactly. Did you find a lot of people that said we were discouraged from voting, or was it relatively few? Well, to me it was a relative few, but there were other people. So yeah. after this was all over, then we were sequestered and uh, put everything together, mm -hmm. you know, and, and wrote the thing up. Mm -hmm. and, and the attorneys then reviewed what we had written up. That's one of the things that made it a really long night, uh -huh. because we'd be sure. do our draft and send it to them, and then maybe have to oh, do some more work on something. Yeah. I was just thinking of the historical value of those. Uh, if we've been doing it for some time in elections, mm -hmm. to see how things have changed over the years, if at all. Well, I'm sure they have. Um, well, you were saying earlier that there, there weren't any black people around where you were growing up. Right. Uh, the first black person that I ever saw uh, was at Kennestone Hospital. Uh, I was about four years old and my sister was two. Um, we had uh, gotten poison. We'd eaten some blackberries that had been um, apparently dusted when the crops were dusted and mm -hmm. uh, still had some poison on them. Um, we had, uh, only my grandfather had a, a car and he uh, took us to um, get my mother who worked at the uh, Ackworth Hotel mm -hmm. and Dr. McCall's office is really close to that. Mm -hmm. And I know he pumped my sister's stomach. I don't know if he pumped mine, but they decided we needed to go on to the hospital. And they actually took us to the hospital in the um, police car. Mm -hmm. But so while I was there, um, a nurse came in to check on us. And like I said, that was, that was the first black person I had ever seen. Hmm. And when I was in high school, um, uh, there were um, no black students mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, you were right before the yes, right be began. Before, right before that. Even before freedom of choice. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, you know, in the world of work, uh, that changed really quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe let's just end up by saying, uh, what, what do you think of Ackworth now that you've moved back here, and what have you been doing to save Ackworth History Foundation? Oh, okay. Things like that. Oh, I've really enjoyed being back here. It's such a, a vibrant place, so much going on. Uh, I'm really proud of the professional leadership uh, in the city. Uh, there's lots of parks. Uh, I love the art scene. I'm so glad that we have a, a golf cart community. Mm. And I, I'm also proud of the work that uh, Save Eckworth History Foundation uh, has done and continues to do. Um, and I'm especially proud of my Former classmate, Mac Turner. He and I were in the same class at oh, North really? Cobb. We are. Uh, but uh, he has basically been the, the face of Save Ackworth History mm -hmm. Foundation and mm -hmm. um, su such a great person getting the word out about what we're doing and uh, uh, getting people to donate. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a, a big difference. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, appreciate what you're doing with Save Ackworth History Foundation. And, well, thank and, you. Um, it's been fun talking to you. Mm -hmm.